All right. Hi, everybody. This is Ray and Katie from the Great Falls Public Library, and we are here <laughs> with Katie Elam from Zoo Montana. And she has some new animal friends to introduce to us today. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to her. And I would like to mention that we do have some Bumpy Toad craft kits still available for pickup in Kids Place. And thank you all for your patience. We've had a lot of technical difficulties today, but I think we've got it all figured out and we're good to go. So take it away, Katie. Hey, thank you, Ray. Hello, my friends. So because I am on the Zoom end of this call, I will be asking Ray to watch for any questions or comments that we get. Now, again, my name is Katie and I'm at the zoo at, in Zoo Montana, all the way in Billings. So I'm pretty far from you, but I still think it's very cool that we get to do these virtual programs. Now, today we're going to be meeting three different animals and talking about what makes them so dang special. But before we get started, I am going to introduce my friend who's gonna be helping me with a couple of the animals. This is Brooke, and she'll be helping us with some of our animals today. Now, before I bring anything out, I wanted to let you know, I'm not gonna bring anything dangerous with me today. However, I might bring an animal that you're not a big fan of. And I want you to know that's totally okay because I work with animals for my job, and even I have animals I'm a little bit afraid of. What I want you to do is if you see an animal that you're afraid of, just take a deep breath and know that you are safe, know that we are safe, and that you can learn something about this animal, even if it's a little bit weird or a little bit spooky. Now, once again, you are more than welcome to leave comments, leave questions in the comments of the Facebook notification there, that Facebook screen, and Ms. Ray here will happily send those on to me. Today, we are going to be talking about amphibians, and amphibians are that super cool and super slimy, weird group of animals that have wet, slimy skin. They are cold-blooded, they tend to live in or at least near water, and they lay eggs but their eggs are not hard shelled like this egg in the background right here. They're soft and jelly-like. So those are all different characteristics that make an animal an amphibian. They're also in the group that we call vertebrates. Last week you might've seen, we talked about invertebrates, animals that do not have a backbone. And amphibians are in, the group, are in that group that is categorized as vertebrates. Vertebrates are animals that just have a backbone. This is part of the backbone of a deer. And as you can see, it's got lots of different bones connected to each other, along with ribs coming off of those bones. Most vertebrates have a backbone that looks something like this. It may just be a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger. So the animals you're meeting today all have bones and all have backbones, even if they look a little different from ours. All right, so do we have any questions or comments so far before we introduce our first animal friends? No, we don't. All right, no worries. All right, friends, our first that we are meeting is actually a Montana native animal. They are tiger salamanders. Tiger salamanders can be found in a lot of different parts of the state, and in fact, all over most of North America, except in the desert areas. As long as there's water nearby, they're pretty well set. Now, that means also that they can live, you can bring the case over here, there we go. We do have a carrying case, this is not their home, I promise, yes. So. And here we have Sally, and Sally is a tiger salamander. Like we mentioned earlier, they're pretty big. Let me grab my ruler here. So her tail by itself is about six inches long, and the rest of her body is another five or six inches. She's over 12 inches long, so she's quite a big animal. You can go ahead and pick her up. You'll also notice that Brooke is wearing gloves, and this is not really because she's poisonous. This is because Sally the salamander is an amphibian. I mentioned earlier that they have wet, slimy skin. And this is really important for their way of life because they can breathe and drink through their skin. This makes them, this is why they have to be near water, but this also makes them pretty sensitive to our hands. So if earlier today I used hand sanitizer on my hands and then I went to touch Sally, she could absorb that into her body. Our skin doesn't work like that. Water can come out of our body in the form of sweat, or, but it cannot come in our body. That's why our, our fingers get all pruny when we're swimming for too long. But she can have water come into her body, water come out of her body, air come in her body, air come out of her body without having to use her face, which is really cool to think about. Now, tiger salamanders have lots of different tools for survival. And these tools can be physically on their body and they can be behaviors that they do that all help them to survive. 
These tools are called adaptations and every living organism has adaptations, including you, including cats and dogs, and including, awesome. Let me make sure I pull our screen off. We have a recording, which is super, super cool. Okay. So they have these adaptations, these tools for survival that help them to survive in, in their normal environments. Now they can live in Montana and throughout North America because they are mostly an underground animal. They use their strong front legs to dig tunnels underground. And with this helps them to avoid very hot temperatures and very cold temperatures. And they even hibernate like a, a similar to a bear over the winter to make sure that they can survive. And we are going to bring Sally nice and close to the camera for you to get a good look at her before we keep talking about her other adaptations or tools for survival. There we go. You can probably tell from the stripes on her body why she's called a tiger salamander. Nice. All right. So as a tiger salamander, she's got those stripes on her body. She's got a greenish, tannish, brownish body. It's about 12 inches long, like we mentioned earlier. She's got very strong front legs there that help her to dig tunnels and also move herself across the ground. And she also can swim. Although as an adult, it's a little bit more difficult. You probably know that many frogs, which are a type of amphibian, have a metamorphosis cycle. They start out as a tiny little egg and then they hatch and they are what we call a tadpole. And I actually have a little life cycle here to show you. All right, let's see. Oh, I think it's flipped around. There we go. So we start off with our egg right here and then our tadpole. This one starts to develop the two legs and then it has four legs here. And then it's an adult with no tail and four feet legs. That's called metamorphosis. And amphibians go through this too. Salamanders are a little bit different. They don't have quite as many stages. When they hatch out of their egg, they still have their four legs and their tail. But one thing that is different is they have what's called external gills. If you've ever seen a picture of an animal called an axolotl, it looks like it has a little fringe around its neck. Those are external gills. They help them to absorb water or absorb oxygen from the water. And that's what baby salamanders have when they hatch out of their eggs. Once they're growing up and growing big enough, they'll have internal lungs like we do that allow them to go on land. They can also retain their gills along the side of their neck if they need to live in a more wet environment when they're adults. So there's a lot of flexibility in the life of an amphibian which is really cool. Now, do we have any other questions so far? No questions so far, but I left a uh, comment. So if you have any questions about this fantastic salamander or any of the other Zoo Montana animals, if you leave it in the comments and I will pass it along to Katie and Brooke. Perfect. All right. So salamanders are carnivores, or at least this species is, the tiger salamanders, which means they eat other animals. In particular, tiger salamanders are focusing on small invertebrates mostly. So insects, spiders, other small critters that live in the water. But they will also go after larger things like small mice or small lizards, other small salamanders, even small frogs. Anything that they can catch, they're going to eat, which is part of why they're called the tiger salamander. Not just because of those stripes, but also because of that appetite that she has. You might also notice that long tail. I mentioned earlier that her tail is six inches long and her body is 12 in, or six inches long as well. So that really long tail helps her to move very fast in the water if she does need to swim because it helps like a rudder to move her through. It also is pretty powerful. One of the coolest things about this particular kind of amphibian though is the way that they can regrow some of their legs or some of their limbs. If an animal catches her by her tail and chomps it off, she can regrow it. And same with her legs. If she gets enough food and survives the shock of it, she can regrow that tail, those legs, and be perfectly fine. In the wild, these animals tend to live about eight to 10 years, which means with us here at the zoo, she might live as long as 15 or even 20 years. So she has quite a long lifespan left ahead of her. We're pretty sure that she hatched around 2016 or 2017, and she's been here at the zoo since 2019. So she's about five or four or five years old and has been here for about two or three years. All right, my friends, if there are no questions so far, I think we can move on to our next 
animal friend. And I also think one of your craft activities is about a beaded salamander. So that's a cool one to check out. Think. All right, friends. There we go. So we just met our first amphibian. And the salamanders are just one of them. There's multiple kinds of amphibians in the world. There's another one called Sicilians, which is a very weird name, but they look like worms, except that they have bones because normal worms don't have bones. So those are the groups that we don't have here at the zoo. But the other two groups of amphibians include frogs and toads. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Now, the difference between frogs and toads can be a little bit strange because they don't always look very different. But typically, if you think of frogs, you think of the rainforest tree frogs or the poison dart frogs that live in South America. And when you think of toads, you probably think of the large, bumpy little toads that don't jump very far. And that right there tells you pretty much a big difference between frogs and toads. One of the things is their bumpy skin. Toads have very bumpy skin because, not because they're going to give people warts, but because they have special glands under their skin that help protect them. Many po toads are poisonous because this helps them to protect themselves with their soft skin. Poison means that there's toxins inside their skin, right? If they bite something, it's not going to hurt that animal. But if the animal bites them, they could get sick from the toxins or the poison in their skin. So we are going to meet our toad friend first. Are you ready? All right, my friends, this here is Cheech. And Cheech is a cane toad. Cane toad, C-A-N-E. They are from South America. And as you can see, she's ready to come out and meet everybody. Cane toads, again, are from originally from South America. And they're called cane toads because they tend to live in cane fields, sugar cane fields. Are you ready? And in those fields, they typically eat a lot of other animals, like in uh, cane beetles or other small animals. But humans decided that they needed their help eating those cane beetles in other places, like in Australia. These toads are not from Australia, but when they started growing sugar cane in Australia, they needed the help of the cane beetles so that, or the cane toads, so they brought them out. And then cane toads became invasive. So we're going to talk about what invasive means in just a second, but I wanted you to get a good close up of Cheech here. You see, she's got those stumpy legs, those big old toes right there. She's got big, strong legs in the back here. This puffed up area behind her eyes, that's one of her poison glands. She's not excluding any poison right now. Normally it's a big white color. So she's not super unhappy right now. She's just kind of hanging out for a second. But look how big her eyes are. And she's got horizontal or horizontal pupils. She's got her nose that's moving. And then that little pouch that's moving behind her eyes is actually her eardrums. So they've got good hearing, they've got good eyesight, and they've even got good smell too, which is pretty cool. All right, I am gonna let her sit back in here so she feels more comfortable that way. Whoop, there we go, hi. All right, I think we're gonna let her go back because she wants to go back to her house. Give me just a second here. Yeah. Okay, now that you've at least seen what the cane toad looks like, we'll talk a little bit more about her. Cane toads are pretty big. I don't know if you can tell from my hands, but she's about four and a half inches across, about this big, and she's probably close to two and a half inches tall, and that's pretty big. Cane toads are also called marine toads, which means that they can spend time in salt water, unlike many other frogs, toads, and salamanders. So they can, they're really adaptable animals. They also can lay up to 30,000 eggs in one go. And this is part of why they became invasive. Invasive, when you talk about an animal or a plant, typically means that they are introduced mostly by humans usually into an area where they thrive really well and there's no predators, which sounds really good, except 
They start eating the food of the animals that already live there. They start living in the spaces where those animals already lived, or they start eating those animals. And this is a big problem in Australia. In Australia, there's a lot of really cool snakes and lizards and birds and mammals or marsupials that are found nowhere else on earth. And when cane toads came over, they decided that they didn't want to eat the cane beetles. They wanted to eat everything else. And because they're so big and because they're poisonous, most animals can't eat them. So because they also lay 30,000 eggs at once, those eggs hatch within a couple of weeks and they have a bunch of cane toads everywhere. They are also poisonous throughout their whole lifespan. So they're poisonous as an egg, poisonous as a tadpole, poisonous as a froglet, and poisonous as an adult frog. So all of these things mean that it's a bit difficult to control their populations because most animals can't eat them. But they're still very cool animals. Like I mentioned earlier, frogs and toads have similar bodies. They've got the bent legs that help them hop. They've got the usually shorter front legs, and they've got that similar body shape. My favorite thing about toads is that warty skin. That warty looking skin is not warts at all. Instead, like I mentioned earlier, it's a type of gland. Those glands contain toxins and also other ways to protect them, kind of like armor on their skin. They also have good eyesight and particularly good night vision. King toads are nocturnal, which means they tend to live or they come out at night and that's when they go hunting. They listen for their food, they look for it, and they can smell for it too. All right. They also, one of the big differences between toads and frogs is their legs themselves. Even though they both have those bent legs that help them to hop, their legs are different. T toads tend to have short, stumpy legs and usually larger bodies. And when you combine these things, it means that toads don't tend to hop very long or very far like some frogs can. So they can show short, they can hop short distances, but not very far at a time. Now, cane toads are one of the largest species of amphibians in the world, and they live in a lot of different places, thanks to humans and thanks to their ability to be so adaptable. Some of their tools for survival include that ability to be near seawater or ocean water, the salty water, as well as the ability to breathe and drink through their skin. As long as their skin is wet, they can survive in a lot of different types of habitats, which is super cool. All right, my friends, does anyone else have questions about our cane toad? I know we didn't get to see her for very long. We'll see our other friend here in just a second. Nobody has any questions? I find that really hard to believe, guys. You really don't have a question about the salamanders or the toads? I mean... They're, they're pretty cool, but they're also, they're very different from us. So I bet some of you have some questions and you're just not sharing them. So I'm not now, <laughs> the time. now would be the time. All right, friends, while you're thinking of any questions that you want to share with us, I'll tell you something else pretty cool about amphibians. And it's something that I mentioned earlier, and that it is they are cold blooded. Cold blooded just means that their blood temperature changes depending on their environment. It doesn't mean that their blood is actually cold all the time. So the scientific word for cold-blooded is ectothermic. Ecto means outside and thermic means heat, so outside heat. We, humans and other mammals, are warm-blooded or endothermic, inside heat. Some of the energy from the food that we eat goes to keeping our blood at a solid 98 degrees. Doesn't matter if it's 100 degrees outside or zero degrees outside. If it's really hot out, our body sweats to keep our blood at 98 degrees. If it's very cold out, our body shivers to keep our blood at 98 degrees. But no matter how much food an amphibian eats or another cold-blooded ectothermic animal eats, all it's going to do is feed them to do other things. It's not going to warm up their blood. So instead, they have to rely on the sun or shade to help them. If they're getting too hot outside in a desert sometimes, they might just become a nocturnal or a nighttime animal. Or if they are too cold during the night, they'd have to find a nice warm spot to stay in so that when the sun comes out, they can warm themselves up because they can't do it themselves. They have to let the sun do it or the environment around them. This is very important. And that's also why you don't see very many amphibians or reptiles or other cold-blooded animals in the north. Here in Montana, we have about, I believe, 10 different species of snakes. We have about four different species of lizards and a few different toads and frogs, but not very many compared to a lot of other places that have tons of species. 
there's over 300 different kinds of toads in the world. And most of them live in the warm areas of the world. So we don't have very many here in Montana. Now, if you've ever found a salamander or a toad in the wild, good job. The part of the thing about salamanders and toads and frogs is that they're pretty hard for people to find in general. Part of that is because they come out at night or they're on the ground or underground. Fun fact, the word for an animal that lives underground is, so arboreal is up in trees, on the ground is just on the ground, and underground is a really fun word. Does anyone remember it? Let's see if you remember it. Hmm. Let's see. I'm quizzing you because I'm trying to remember the word for it too, but it's a really big word. It's a really cool word. I kind of like it. So if an animal is arboreal, it lives in trees. If it lives on the ground, let's see. Lives underground. See, it's okay if you don't always remember things all the time because I have a hard time with that. Let's see. Oh, I love this word. Okay. It sounds like a different word, but the word is fossorial. F-O-S-S-O-R-I-A-L. A-L. So fossorial, which sounds like fossil to me, means that they spend time underground. And that's also why you don't see many amphibians here in Montana. They tend to spend their time underground during the day when it's nice and hot, especially in the summer. And in the winter, when it's too cold, they'll also be underground because it's a little bit warmer underground. And usually a little bit more moisture is underground as well. However, if you do ever see an amphibian here in the wild, it's super cool to watch them. Just be careful because some of them can be poisonous and you might not know it. But also, you want to make sure that you're not going to touch them and have them absorb the stuff that's on your skin. Remember when we talked about the salamander, I said that they have the ability to drink with their skin, right? They don't even have to open their mouth. That also means that if you have sunscreen, bug spray, hand sanitizer, any of that, or lotion on your hands and you pick up an amphibian, it'd be like if you drink hand sanitizer, lotion, bug spray, sunscreen. It's not good for us and it's not good for them either. All right, I've been rambling for a bit. Do we have any other questions or even comments? Has anyone seen one here in Montana, a salamander or a toad? So unfortunately we don't have any other comments and I, so I've been in Montana for five years. I don't know that I've seen very many, um, but I grew up in Indiana and I used to catch toads, little tiny toads all summer long. That's awesome. But then I went back to where I used to catch them and I didn't see any. Ooh, all right. Do you, do you happen to know why that might be? I bet you I can make a good educated hypothesis for you. So. We're gonna think about that though. I want you all who's watching this to think about that too. Why do you think we don't see them anymore in some places? Because we still have one more animal friend to meet. So I will bring them out so that you can see them. And then after we talk about that one, we'll talk about why there may not be as many amphibians anymore. All right, here we go. All right, friends, this here is Yoda. And Yoda is a white tree frog, or also called a dumpy tree frog. Now these adorable little frogs are all the way from Australia, but they're also a pretty common pet here in the United States. And it's pretty awesome. They have some really amazing adaptations. And it also can kind of show you the difference between a frog and a toad. Hey buddy, can you come here? There we go. All right, I'm gonna bring it close to the camera for you to see. So as you can see, he's got that shiny slimy skin, which is normal for frogs and such. There we go. He's got those big eyes like we saw with Cheech. Let me see if my camera will just focus on our friend here. There we go. She got a smaller pointier nose. He's got big toes that help him to stick onto things like my gloves here. He's got the big ears that are back here behind the eyes and a nose. There we go. You'll also notice even though the skin is slimy like it was with our friend Cheech the toad, this skin is much smoother. There's no bumps on her on his skin here. All right. So 
this kind of amphibian, a frog, has a lot of really amazing adaptations. Some that they share with other amphibians and some that they keep to themselves. One that they can do is they can create a mucus coating, which sounds really gross and it kind of is, but it's very important because in Australia, where these little frogs live, they are part of what is called a seasonal forest. The seasonal forests are dry in some seasons and wet in other seasons. And during the wet season, obviously this kind of frog is perfectly fine. They love it during the wet season and their skin can stay nice and wet and slimy. But in the dry season, they can get in trouble because their skin can't stay dry enough or wet enough for them to breathe or drink very well. So what instead they do is create that mucusy coating. It's kind of gross and honey-like, it's very thick and it's very wet. So they coat their whole body in this mucus coating and then it helps protect them and keep them wet inside. It's kind of like a cocoon for a butterfly or a caterpillar. And it helps keep them nice and wet so that they can survive until the next wet season. One of the things that they share in common with a lot of other amphibians that's harder to see is the fact that they use their eyeballs to swallow. Now that sounds a bit weird, but if you've ever seen a picture or a video of a frog or a toad or even a salamander as they grab their food, you might notice they close their eyes and they make a really weird face. They kind of, they kind of pull their head back and pull their eyes back. And that's because they are using their eyeball muscles to shove their food down their mouth. So they use their long tongue to catch their food, bring it inside their mouth. They have a little teeth, but they don't usually use their teeth to chew very much. And then they blink and shove their eyes down and it helps them push food down their throat. It's very strange, but very cool at the same time. Now, this particular frog is not very large. I'm gonna grab my ruler here. And pardon me, my mask is falling down here. He's only about three inches long and about two inches wide. And that's pretty normal for these kinds of frogs. In the wild, the males get to be about three inches long and the females are a little bit bigger at four inches or so. But here at the zoo, they also can live a bit longer. In the wild, they would live about five to eight years. Here with us here at the zoo, they might live as long as 15 to 20. So they have quite a long lifespan. Yoda here has been at the zoo for about three years and is only probably about four or five years old. At the zoo, all three of our amphibians eat mostly insects, things like crickets, beetles, superworms, other small worms. Very occasionally, we might give them a different kind of treat, but we also make sure that they get all the nutrients that they need. All right, my friends, are there any questions or comments or things that you wanna ask about the zoo in general? questions came in on Facebook. That's totally all right. No problem. Oh yeah, then we were going to talk about Miss Ray's question about why we don't see as many amphibians in some places. Remember earlier and a lot during this program, I've mentioned the fact that amphibians can breathe and drink through their skin. Now this is a super cool adaptation. It allows them to live in a lot of really interesting environments and allows them to not have to use their mouths for breathing or drinking. However, it also means that they're very, very sensitive to water. If the water is unhealthy in any way, if there's lots of toxins or pollution in the water, they absorb that into their bodies and then it can make them very sick. Here at the zoo, we're even careful to use a specific kind of treated water to make sure that they don't get sick from the water that we use here. So that means that in the wild, they can be very prone to getting sick. People use um, pesticides like trying to get rid of mosquitoes if we use those outside they might get they might get these guys sick because they're like oh i found a dead mosquito yay for me and then they eat it and they can get sick from that or if they accidentally are nearby when we spray those mosquitoes they can get the spray in their body also because that spray is near water because mosquitoes are near water they could get in the water and make them sick also there are a few other challenges that they face with climate changing and things getting a lot hotter in a lot of places, or at least not as good as they should be in some places. A lot of wetlands where most frogs and toads and salamanders live are starting to dry up or be fragmented or broken apart. So they have less areas in which to find a home. So there's lots of ways that frogs are having a hard time lately, especially if they're near waterways. You know, even in agriculture, if we use fertilizers, 
um, that are chemical instead of um, different kinds of, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of fertilizer, but there's certain fertilizers are not good for the waters and not good for the frogs and the toads and the salamanders. All right, friends, I'm just gonna bring Yoda here closer because I just wanna show you again how freaking cute this little frog is. Look at this little frog. This little ridge right here that kind of looks like a bunch of skin, that little ridge right there is pretty characteristic or pretty often found on White's tree frogs. So that's one of the ways that it's easy to identify them. They kind of have that extra fold of skin over their eyes. You see his big old toe pads that help him hold on to things. Oh, look, he's just saying hi. <laughs> big long legs he's got tucked up underneath him that can make him leap really far if he wants to. He's even got little white dots on his back. Those little white dots are just one of the things that tells you that he is a white tree frog. All right, my friends. We don't have any questions. I'll go ahead and let our friend here go back. I'm gonna give him a little bit more water because he's been out for a bit. And I want his skin to stay nice. But if we don't have questions, I'll let him go back and then I'll talk to you a little bit more. All right. Hi, buddy, you wanna come down in here? Whoop, he's gonna climb out. There we go, hi, good job. Can you go down here? He likes to climb things. You can see he's climbing all over my hand, huh? Hi, you come here. Good job. There we go. All right. I'll take my gloves off. There we go. Get the back of the fingers. Thank you all for being very patient. I hope you get to do a fun craft about our toad friend or our salamander friend. And we do have lots of really awesome amphibians, or not lots, but several lots of, or several amphibians here in Montana that are really cool. And one of my favorite resources for identifying them is the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Um, uh, they have a field guide online that you can either print out or you can just take pictures and compare it to their field guide. So if you go outside and you see a frog or a toad, or a salamander, you can take a picture of it and then look online to see what kind it is here in Montana. It's super cool. And there's even times that you can help frogs and, and other amphibians themselves. They're not during their breeding seasons, especially salamanders, but sometimes frogs too. They travel long distances to find each other. You'll often hear them calling at night in the summertime. They make a beautiful chorus because they're calling out for their friends or their families. And when they're doing that, sometimes they have to travel across roadways. So if you're ever driving and you see something that says salamander warning ahead, that means that there might be salamanders on the road. So if you can slow down or help any salamanders across the road, if you can do it safely, that can be a one way that you can help salamanders too and amphibians in general. All right, friends, does anyone have any questions? No questions. If we don't have any, that's okay. Yeah, we, we don't have any. No problem. All right, my friends, next week, I'd love for you to join us. We're gonna be showing you a different group of animals. And this one is a really different diverse group of animals. They all look very different from each other and they're super cool. So join us next week to learn what the animal is going to be. Make sure you get your craft kits from the library. And in the meantime, we'll see you later. Thanks so much for watching today. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your amphibians with us, Katie. Absolutely. Thank you, Ray, for hosting this and for working through those technical difficulties. You did awesome. Yes. And hopefully we start on time next week. So thank, thank you, everybody, for your patience. And we will see you next Wednesday at 1.30 for some more fantastic Zoo Montana animals. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.